Hello, welcome to Potential Pitfalls in Post-Trust Creation, What Happens After a Revocable Estate Plan is Created. Before we begin, we have a couple of housekeeping announcements. You will receive your MCLE certificate shortly after the program. Please take a moment to complete the survey that is included with your, with your certificate. Uh, let's talk about our sponsors now. The Trust and Estate section is sponsored by the Sanborn Team, Geffen Real Estate, Glen Oaks Escrow, California Title Company, and Manufacturers Bank. Today, we have uh, Nancy and Brian, who will talk about the Sanborn team. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we wanted to let you know that in addition to selling uh, properties, we often get requests for broker price opinions. Please know we are happy to assist you and your clients with these requests. We hope you enjoy the meeting. Thank you, everyone. And now, Orit Gadish will speak. Hi, everyone. I'm Orit Gadish, broker and owner of Geffen Real Estate, a dynamic brokerage specializing in serving the trust and estate community with a team of 25 agents with boots on the ground throughout Southern California. I recently pub- launched my book titled The Practitioner's Handbook for Probate Real Estate. Thank you so much for those of you who have read it and wrote a review. I truly appreciate it. For those of you who have not read it yet, please take a minute to check it out. It's available on Amazon and the link is in the chat box. Take a few minutes to read the reviews, and if you're interested in reading it and providing a review, please text me, and I'll have a complimentary copy shipped to you. Enjoy your program, and back to you, Megan. Thank you, Reed. In addition to the Sanborn team and Geffen Real Estate, the Trust and Estate section is also sponsored by Glen Oaks Escrow. Marcine Klein is a full-service escrow officer specializing in probate, trust sales, conservatorship, and both court and independent administration of estate act transactions. On a daily basis, Marcin works to ensure that even the most challenging escrows close smoothly and that our clients are beyond happy with their experience at Glen Oaks Escrow. California Title Company provides comprehensive and timely title insurance protection for home buyers, including first-time home buyers, sellers, veterans, and military personnel, seniors, real estate agents, and brokers, mortgage lenders, and commercial real estate professionals. And let's talk now about Manufacturers Bank. Manufacturers Bank can do, do it all. Let the Manufacturers Bank has a dedicated trust and estate banking team with the experience to handle all your banking needs. Please contact Brian Flores, the Vice President and Senior Relationship Manager for more information. Now let's get on to the program. Today, Dina Nam will be presenting. She is a wealth strategist with Advice Period. Her primary focus is working with high net worth individuals and families to facilitate the most tax efficient transfer of wealth. Prior to joining Advice Period, Dina worked at both national and international law firms, specializing in sophisticated estate and tax planning, including family wealth transfers for large estates, complex estate and gift tax, saving techniques, and probate and trust administration work. Please welcome Dina. Hi, Megan. Thanks for the introduction. Um, And welcome, everybody. Uh, So today's program, and uh, let me share my screen so we can start with the materials, is entitled Nuts and Bolts, Potential Pitfalls Post-Trust Creation. And so what my goal with this program is to really talk about what happens after you create a revocable estate plan and what kind of pitfalls or footfalls that practitioners might experience going through that stage of the process with their clients. Because uh, working more on the financial side, which is what advice period is, we tend to see more of what happens when you know, people don't, uh, and this is a little bit of a preview, but forget to fund their trust or don't, don't update title. And so working with the clients and making sure everything is buttoned up neatly and order so that they can avoid some of the larger issues that may come, such as probate and whatnot. So we'll talk a little bit about that. But first, I just want to start kind of at the beginning because I'm not sure where everyone is coming from in terms of their estate planning experience. So apologies if it's a little bit of a repeat for a lot of people on this call, but just wanted to make sure everyone was on the same page. So the estate planning basics, what am I talking about? So when we talk about an estate plan, here's sort of a a quick little laundry list of the kinds of documents that were I'm generally referring to. So there's always going to be a revocable trust or a living trust, however you want to refer to it. There is a will. There is a durable power of attorney for financial decisions and a healthcare directive, HIPAA authorization. And last but not least, a general assignment of assets. 
uh, really will only be focusing on three of these documents as it pertains to trust funding and how they all work in tandem together to make sure a plan is executed properly for a client. So, you know, just very quickly, a revocable trust, it's effective during a lifetime. We're talking about an amendable or revocable one. And this is not necessarily focused on any kind of tax planning. So all these assets are included in the estate at death. The big key ticket item here is that the revocable trust, as long as there's no contest or objection, will not be subject to probate. It's a private proceeding, and these are generally private documents that you don't have to file anywhere else. It's just shared amongst a smaller group of individuals as opposed to filings and things that you have to submit to the court when you, when you do a more traditional style probate. Um, also, Will, I think, this is considered sort of a belt and suspenders approach in most practitioners' minds, but the will is only effective at death. And when I'm talking about a will in this context, I'm exclusively talking about a pour over will. So a pour over will is generally a document that says everything I own at my death, I intend it to be owned by my revocable trust that I've set up. And so nothing is really distributed according to the terms of a will. The one myth that I want to dispel for anyone on, who doesn't know is that even if you have a will, you still have to go through a probate process. It's just more guided and it's a testate versus an intestate situation. And one of the key differences is the will is a public document that you must lodge with the court when somebody passes. Um, not necessarily relevant to this particular call, but it is a document where you can also name guardians for minor children. So it is an important part of an estate plan, even if you put everything in your revocable trust. And last but not least, the general assignment of assets. Um, I hope that most practitioners on this call do include a general assignment of assets with their estate plan. And we'll talk about it, we'll talk about it a little bit later why it's really important, but it functions effectively as assigning assets that you don't really have a, a separate document indicating that you own it. So things that you could think about is your furniture, your clothing. Um, you know, jewelry and artwork, which may or may not have title, depends on how expensive it is or how you acquired it. So, you know, fine art, you might have something, but maybe something that you paid a few thousand dollars for, you might not have an official document because it may not generally be worth a lot or, you know, anything at all. Um, it's also really important to potentially avoid the longer, more prolonged probate process. And we'll talk about the Hegstad petition uh, backup. Uh, and like I said, it's generally considered a backup document that we hope not to use. But if you don't have it, it can really end up um, tying your hands as to what you can do after somebody passes. And as a general practice, it's always better to re rely on having title updated to all the assets that you can rather than the general assignment. But again, it all works in conjunction with the larger estate plan to make sure you have all of your ducks in a row. So really getting to sort of the meat of the presentation is this post-trust creation pitfalls. What am I talking about? And in general, the way I think about estate planning is it's really a two-step process. You know, step one is the process that most people are familiar with. You meet with your client, you create the estate plan, and then you execute the documents that uh, the client has prepared. But the other thing too is people forget that you really have to consider there's a step two, and that is funding the trust and making sure all the assets that you can put in the trust are properly in the trust. And then there are maybe some ancillary assets that we'll talk about where you may not necessarily put it in the trust now, but you have to think about what happens if the owner passes away, what, what, what do we do with it and how, we, how can we avoid probate? Because the goal of setting up a revocable estate plan is obviously avoid probate in California. You know, other states may be different, but as we all know, probate in California can be very time consuming. It can get very expensive for the client. And overall, it just is a process that most people don't want to put their families through if they can avoid it. So the step two is 
you know, I'll kind of share a story of a client that I worked with where she had set up an estate plan and I don't know who she worked with. So I'm not going to name names or anything like that, but she set up an estate plan. And then she came to me after she got married and she says, Oh, well, I need to update my estate plan because I'm married now. I have a child. Um, my you know, intentions have changed. My assets have changed. I'm like, great. So as I go through her plan, uh, one of the things that she did not do was she owned a house and it wasn't title wasn't updated in the name of her trust. And so let me advance to the next slide is that, you know, she thought, oh, well, my estate planning documents are signed. I'm done. And I, everything is good and all, everything will be taken care of. And I had to tell her, well, actually, no, your trust at this time is basically like a, tu a empty Tupperware container. You've, you have the container, but there's nothing in it right now. It doesn't, it, you have to fill it with assets in order for that Tupperware container to actually work and hold what you want it to hold. So that's, I think, one of the first pitfalls is where clients just think that as soon as they've executed an estate plan, they've done everything they need to do and they can just move on. And as we all know, that's generally not the case. There is that next step in the process, which can each attorney, I think, has a different level of involvement of what they do or don't do, but it's just something that oftentimes gets missed and really does need to be discussed and followed through with the client. Even if the attorney themselves, are, they're not transferring the assets or updating things, it's, it's really important to at least have that conversation with the client so they understand, okay, there is some work to be done after they've executed their estate plan. So that's one of the big common pitfalls just wanted to highlight for the group. I think the second pitfall is as we all know, you know, people's lives change. Um, you know, people get married, people get divorced, people have kids, people die. That's all part of the process. But what can get missed is that people's asset and their composition of what they own also changes over time. They sell things, they buy new things, they you know acquire things through different means, whether via an inheritance, via via gift, via divorce, what, whatever the case may be. What they own at the time their trust is created versus what they own when they pass away is very, very different for most people. So another common pitfall I see is that clients acquire new things and forget to title them in their trust. Because again, either they think that once they sign the estate plan, it's done and it's just assumed to be a part of their trust, or they just forget even if they've been told. So it's just this constant ongoing maintenance of educating a client, reminding them whenever they get something, buy something new or buy a new house or, or whatnot, just make sure it's titled in the name of the trust um, or via some other mechanisms um, that we'll talk about a little bit later, just to make sure it's covered in the event of a probate. Um, the last one I just kind of threw in because I don't see it as, as often, quite frankly, but you know, there was a point in time, and this was probably true maybe five or 10 years ago, not so much now, but when real properties, when people would refinance, the lenders would often take the house or property out of the trust, refinance it, and then forget to retitle it in the name of the trust. And there have been a few instances where I have seen that. And obviously on the front end, the attorney or whoever did their estate plan worked, did the work correctly where they put the property in the trust and the, some subsequent action that the client took ended up taking it out for whatever reason, unbeknownst to the attorney. And then when that person passes and it's still not in the trust, then we have a bit of an issue where what happens and how do we deal with this property that's no longer titled in the name of the trust. So um, not to say that we're going to, we as practitioners are going to know every time somebody refinances, but it's just something to, again, part of the education process of reminding a client, everything that you can put in the trust, you should put in the trust. Um, but I think nowadays lenders tend to be a bit more savvy. And so they don't necessarily take it out of the trust anymore in order to refinance. But um, I don't know every lender's procedure. So you may see some, uh, some issues out there floating around. So I also wanted to talk briefly about, you know, categories of assets. What are we generally talking about? Because depending on the category of the asset, there may be a different way to deal with it on the front end when you're trying to fund a trust. So 
most of the time we're dealing with assets that have some kind of title documentation. And traditionally, we're talking about bank accounts where you can update the name on the account or the account owner to the trust. Um, real property is obviously a big one where you have to file a deed with the county where the um, property is located in order to transfer it to the trust. And then you know, other miscellaneous interests, maybe they own a business or some of that, or, or an LLC or some kind of private holding that does have documentation like an operating agreement or a stock certificate, something of that nature that is a piece of paper or something written that indicates that they own that particular asset. So things like that can be transferred to the trust and absent certain, you know, uh, discussions with a client for specific purposes should be transferred to the trust. Those tend to be high value. The other general category of assets that we'll be talking about is an asset with a beneficiary designation. And traditionally, those tend to be life insurance, retirement accounts, or any kind of, um, you know, income deferred, um, you know, retirement or, or deferment plan, and then pay on death or, um, you know, transfer on death accounts where you can designate who receives that account when you pass. And we'll go into a little bit more detail on those. Um, I've included a category on cars and motorized vehicles, things that are registered with the DMV, because there's also a specific way that you can handle them. And what are some potential pitfalls that may come up with in those groups of assets? The one thing we're not really going to talk too much about assets that have title because I I think that's relatively straightforward in terms of how to transfer it to the trust. You often have to work with a bank or the prepare a deed or you know update a stock certificate in order to get that particular asset in the name of the trust. And to do that, it's just you name the trust name, date, and the trustee as the new owner of that asset. I do want to speak very, very briefly about joint assets or jointly held accounts or um, assets that are, for example, real property, you know, joint, jointly held property with right of survivorship. And in those situations, I'm not talking about jointly held assets with a married couple because those should be in a joint trust in most situations. But there have been some instances where we have clients that own a joint account with a sibling or with a parent or somebody else. And the reason why they hold that is for a very specific reason. It's to either provide their parent or sibling with access to funds and they just want to have a joint account. Um, likewise, with jointly held real property, maybe it's their mother's home or their father's home or their parents' home that they hold jointly, but the intention is for that house to be uh, with the, the other family member. So you, so I think you want to, you want to be very careful about those kinds of um, assets and not just assume everything should be in the trust, but watch out for that. And the reason why I say that is in con when you're doing this step two process, to the extent you can ask the client for some kind of balance sheet or list of assets to go over it so that you can have these end up in-depth conversations, I think would be really, really important because that's kind of what we do at my company. We, we have the balance sheet for clients and we go through each asset and we say, okay, who owns it? Is it properly titled? Is this what you want? Is this the intention? But kind of going back to my point about joint accounts is, you know, if you transfer it to the trust, then, you know, what happens to the other person? And so you, I think you just have to be very careful and have a conversation with the client is, why is this account held jointly? What do you want to do with it? And what are the consequences if you name it in the trust versus, or, or if you update your title or your piece in the name of the trust versus if you don't? Because in some cases, it may break that right of survivorship intention. And that may be a consequence that the client did not intend. So just kind of watch out for stuff like that when you're dealing with joint accounts and it's not the spouse. Um, so let me move on. The other kind of baseline discussion I want to have or just highlight is non-probate assets. What are we talking about? So you know, any non-probate asset is an asset that is not subject to probate proceedings. So it doesn't have to go through the court process in order to get transferred to the intended beneficiary. So I've listed some examples. Assets held in a trust will not be subject to probate. Assets with a proper benefic beneficiary designation will also be, 
not be subject to probate. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, I talked, I mentioned uh, joint accounts with right of survivorship. So by operation of law, if one person passes, it's going to go to the survivor as long as that person is alive um, and can receive the assets. And then again, assets designated payable on death and transfer on death, those are all also not subject to probate proceedings as well. But the idea being that there is an alternate mechanism by which that particular asset can go to the intended beneficiary if it's not inside a trust. So those are all the categories of non-probate assets that I'm, we're typically talking about. And the whole goal of this, again, is to re reiterate that you're trying to avoid probate, right? You don't want the client to have to go to court to transfer assets. So by any means, as long as it meets the client's goals, it is to avoid probate and make sure it falls into one or more one of these categories of assets that are not subject to probate. So I wanna talk a little bit about assets with um, beneficiary designations. And again, reminders that this is talking about life insurance, we're talking about retirement accounts, payable on death, transfer on death. I don't, oftentimes, you know, attorneys don't get heavily involved in this because it's the way you transfer these beneficiary designated assets is you have to go to the insurance company, for example, and get the form where internal form where they client fills it out and lists who they want to receive uh, the assets. Same goes with retirement accounts and same thing goes for pay on death or transfer on death accounts. It, it lies with the bank and it's always going to be some kind of internal document. It varies across all the different custodians. So it's not like one uniform form, but I think there are a couple of things to remember when you're talking about assets with beneficiary designations. One, uh, more, more often than not, clients just may not know this is what they have to do in order to transfer the assets. So they will lean on the attorney to provide them with some guidance as to one, how do I transfer it? And number two, who should be the intended beneficiary? And that obviously is a much longer conversation and really is client specific, depending on what their family situation is like, what their goals are like. But those are things that um, really need to be, those discussions need to be had in order to meet the client's goals of what their estate plan should look like. A um, couple of things with life insurance. I'm not talking, so people often do, people can do a life, irrevocable life insurance trust for estate planning purposes. And so they will name that trust as beneficiary. I'm, I'm not talking about this situation because you wouldn't want to change the beneficiary in that situation because you've done planning and it's in an irrevocable trust outside of the client's taxable estate. But for life insurance proceeds that are just owned, traditional life insurance, you have um, term or life, whatever kind, and client owns it, it's on their life. And at the end of the day, they need to designate a beneficiary. You know, everyone differs and there are different reasons why you want, might want to name a trust versus an individual. But most times we recommend, I think, the life insurance proceeds to flow through the trust. Because at the end of the day, it's just cash that comes into the trust and can be uh, distributed in accordance with how the client wants. I mean, that's not true in every situation. Maybe they have insurance for a specific reason. They want it to go outright to a specific beneficiary. For example, if, if it's a divorce situation, they have, want to provide for their ex-spouse, but they don't want to include that ex-spouse in the trust, then maybe the life insurance policy is set up for that reason. But I think you have to ask those questions as to you know, what is the intention behind this policy? Why do you have it? And how do you want it to flow? Because you don't want to disturb something that is contrary to a client's goals. Um, retirement accounts, that's, there can be a whole, there's a whole, you know, sub specialty in this area, which the nuances are probably outside the scope of today's presentation, but it's also something that goes by beneficiary designation. And it's actually something that you cannot have the trust own outright, just because by nature of what kind of account it is and what the function of it is. Now, a couple of things with regard to uh, retirement accounts, just to highlight as, as issues is, I believe it was 2019, the SECURE Act changed um, quite substantially how long you can stretch out or um, keep the 
assets in a basically income tax deferral type account. Uh, so I highly recommend people to kind of read up on that and, and understand some of the nuances. Um, also, things of things to think about with retirement accounts too is that um, it tends to be people's biggest assets, um, and and so there's a lot of nuance to, nuances to that, which you know I, I can't claim to be an expert, but issues that I've seen at least is people say, well. You know, yes, the spouse gets preferential treatment when they are named as the beneficiary of the retirement account because they can then roll it over into their own and treat it like their own account and have the maximum stretch out provisions um, that are not subject to the Secure Act 10 year limitation. But the flip side of that is the spouse can then change who the ultimate beneficiaries are. And it it really, you know, I can't say one one method is right, one method is wrong, but it's again a conversation that you need to have with the client, like so they understand the full scope of their decision making when they are naming their spouse versus naming a trust, and there are you know pros and cons to each. So that's something also to think about as part of the process. And another thing too is people ask, you know, how much is my family getting from my estate or my, my trust? And they want to have a sense of who's getting how much and what. And oftentimes people forget to consider some of these outside assets that are maybe not in the trust, but part of a client's balance sheet. So they, the, for example, a spouse may be getting, you know, let's say a million dollars from their the trust, but then the people forget that they could have a $2 million retirement account outside of the trust that would, should also factor into how much their spouse is getting. So looking at it in totality, as opposed to just here's what's in the trust and not considering some of those outside assets. And then payable, pay on death accounts, I think is fairly straightforward. Again, naming beneficiaries and um, it can be the trust maybe, but maybe they have an individual that they prefer it to go to. So Again, having these conversations around who gets what with a client is really critical. Um, just wanted to touch briefly on, you know, what are the consequences of failing to designate? And also another factor to consider is what if you've named people, named one person, and that person is predeceases the owner, and there's nobody effectively named as a beneficiary in that situation. Then in both of those situations where either you've fail to name a, a beneficiary or you, uh, the person that you've named is no longer living because they haven't updated their beneficiary designated in 10 years is the same result. You have to have these assets then go through the probate process, which is what you were trying to avoid in the first place. So again, with all of this, it's really trying to avoid um, the probate process as a whole and thinking through not just one step ahead, but maybe two or three steps ahead if you can to really help the client facilitate their goals. So a lot of work on the front end, hopefully will save work on the back end. Oops, sorry. Another thing I just, another kind of interesting uh, asset that I wanted to talk about is, is vehicles or cars or anything that's registered with the uh, DMV. And so it's just specifically talking about California. Because I get a lot of questions from clients like, oh, I have a car. Should I update title? Like, what do you recommend? And for most people, I would think the first bullet point will suffice or will cover. But there are a couple of nuances and a couple of stories I wanted to share where it, it wouldn't apply or it's not available as an option. So the DMV does provide this non-probate process for most vehicles and, and vessels and registered um, motorized vehicles with, that are with them. The first is there's this affidavit for, for transfer without probate. And I think it's called Reg 5 form. It's, you know, if you Google it or search on the internet, it's readily available online um, and you can find it. It's, it's pretty easy. It, there are a couple of key points that you have to remember when using this form. And the first is that you have to wait 40 days after the death of the decedent in order to be able to use this form if that asset is not otherwise named in um, the trust. The other really 
important piece is that the gross value of the decedent's both real and personal property that is outside, that, that is going to be subject to probate or is that outside of any kind of trust and is considered a probatable asset, if that's a word, cannot exceed the $166,250 uh, limit. So the, the, that number, of, if that's familiar, if, that jumps out to people is a small estate's affidavit limitation. And it was, I think in 2020 or 2019, it was just slightly in, adjusted for inflation a little bit from the 150 number that we've all been used to. So it's really important to keep that in mind. And I think for most people who have one or two cars, you know, generally tends to be a depreciating asset. So we're not expecting it to, you know, be higher or more than than what they paid for. As we all know, you drive a car off the lot and 50% of the value suddenly goes down. So you're already uh, in the clear in most situations. But we have had situations, and this actually just came up last year for one of our clients, um, where they passed away, the client passed away, and they had a bunch of cars. And it wasn't even, you know, I don't want to say they weren't classic cars. They weren't anything special. You know, we're not talking about Jay Leno and his garage of, you know, very limited edition cars. We're just talking about regular cars that may be a lot nicer than just your typical car, but still something that you would buy at a car dealership, drive it off the lot. As it turned out, the total value of those cars, Blue Book, Kelly Blue Book value ended up being $1.3 million. So clearly that is beyond the 166 to 50 number that we're talking about. And there, it was not updated. It, the title was not updated. It was in the decedent's individual name. And so I think in that situation, really they had to rely on either the full probate process or maybe one of the other processes or procedures that we'll talk, touch upon shortly. And I'm actually working with a client right now where we're trying to get a title and he's still alive so and young and healthy. So we flagged this issue for him and said, well, you have all these cars. Again, nothing super fancy, super special, but he has kind of a huge garage of cars that range from a Jeep to, you know, Porsche, Ferrari, what, whatever have you, you know, each, each one might be under individually under the 166 limit, but we've totaled up the Kelly Blue value and it's $3.2 million. And we're like, okay, we have a problem. If you pass away and these are all in your name, we're going to have an issue. So let's just try and nip this in the bud now and get things updated. So, you know, it's, it's a pain dealing with the DMV, but we still have to do it because we don't want to have to probate or go to court to transfer these cars. Uh, I see one, I'm trying to answer some of the questions. Some I'll, I'll answer out of order. Uh, there's one question where it says, it's, isn't the case that the motorized vehicles don't count for the 166 limit? I don't know if that's true because when I looked at the form and I could be wrong, but it does have a line where it talks about the 166 limit. So maybe just double check on that. My understanding was that it did, but you know, I could be wrong. I was just looking at the form and it said it does consider that. So um, you know, that may be something to just flag. Um, I'm just sorry, I'm just reading the questions. Okay, so I'll, I'll try to get to some of these at the end. So one of the things, and I, we've kind of been dancing around this issue of, you know, how do we avoid a full probate? And there's a couple of methods that we've been talking about. The big one is this small estates affidavit under probate code section 13100. And it deals with just personal property. So when we talk about personal property, it's typically things like bank accounts, tangible items, et cetera, you know, may maybe some business interests, stock, certific stock certificates, et cetera, et cetera. It's still subject to that 166 and change limitation. So, and when you're talking about that number, it's a collective number in total you're not talking about it on an individual asset by asset basis. So for example, if you have one account that's $100,000 and another account that's $200,000, individually, they might be under the 166 number, but then you, you then have $200,000 that is outside of, or that's above and beyond that 166 number. So just kind of something to keep in mind. Um, so, the, so going back, the comment, is on that question about the 166 limitation. It says, uh, I 
they think it's on the form because if there's a probate administration, then the cars must be included in it, but everything else is less than 166. The cars won't be used to push it over the top. Okay, so maybe that's the response to the question. There is another procedure which I feel like is not really used in California a lot because it's the value is so low. But there is an affidavit for real property of small value for real property that's worth less than $50,000 or $50,000 and less. And I mean, I can't think of the last time any real property in California was valued at $50,000 or less. Maybe it's like a small plot of land somewhere in the middle of, of nowhere. But in Los Angeles County, I I would, you know, it would be hard for us to find anything that would cost, cost less than $100,000, much less $50,000. So what I saw that was an interesting note, though, is like timeshares, which have many timeshares do have some kind of um, deed or a certificate or that's filed that shows some type of ownership of the timeshare, even if it's not land, it's like certificates in a corporation or whatnot. And there were some notes that this affidavit could potentially be used to transfer those timeshares. I've never done it myself, but it's I thought that was an interesting note that I just wanted to share with the group to see if um, that could be you know, useful information or at least something that you could look into if you have a client with a timeshare that perhaps they forgot to transfer this to the trust or they purchased it afterwards and they just did not take care of matters that they should have. Um, the other, the big one though, that I wanted to spend a little bit of time on is the Hexdad petition. And this is such a powerful tool, I think, in California. And I don't know all, this, all the rules in 50 states to indicate um, you know, if they have something similar. But just speaking to California, the Hexad petition really is, can be a very useful tool to help avoid the probate process to transfer assets that you may have forgotten or a client acquires after or any one of those other pit, footfalls or pitfalls that you experience at the beginning. But in order to have the Hegstead petition be available, there are a couple of conditions that need to be satisfied. One is, you know, I'll kind of go backwards, actually, is that you have a signed trust document. I mean, that's, that's an essential piece. If the intention is for all the assets to be owned by a trust, that document has to be a viable and valid and operative document at the time. So to have it executed, signed, um, and valid is key to all of this because you need a receptacle to receive the assets. It can't just be, oh, you know, I, I had an estate plan, I had a draft, I forgot to sign it, but I fully intended to do it. So um, that's not going to fly. Um, kind of working up that bullet point. In the Hegstad case, there was a schedule of assets which listed what that trust should own. And the one uh, piece or property in dispute was listed on the schedule. So that was a really important aspect of having the availability of this tool to say, well, even if I didn't update title officially via a deed, it's listed on the schedule, I have a trust. And then the last point is the decedent actually intended to include that asset in the trust. So all of those conditions were met in order to satisfy the requirements for the petition to be valid. And so you effectively could transfer that asset, one, without having the deed executed, and two, two, probably more importantly in that case, you just had one proceeding as opposed to going through the full probate process in order to transfer that particular asset to the trust. Um, and here I've just listed out the two pivotal cases that I think every practitioner really needs to know and have in their tool belt. And the Hegstad petition, if you did not know, is based on an actual case, a state of Hegstad, which the citation is there for your uh, reference. But I think what's really interesting is in 2015, which feels like a long time ago, but wasn't, there is this Ukestad versus RBS asset finance case, which really, really helped to solidify Hegstad and add another layer of, um, of facts or you know, help support that this type of petition would work um, to transfer assets into a trust, even if you didn't have all your ducks in a row. Again, the citation is there. The key piece I think of this case was that, again, it dealt with um, a piece of real property that the settlor had a general assignment and that's the document we talked about earlier. Um, and there, 
the intention was there, they had the trust. And in this case, the specific you know, points that they highlighted was that made this process or made the transfer possible is that they had this general assignment. And I think that's why I kind of alluded to at the beginning of the presentation that it's so, it can be such a powerful and important document, even if it feels like a throwaway, if you run into this kind of situation and you don't have it. Not to say that the Hexstat petition isn't going to work, but it may weaken your position compared to if you actually had one, then you can cite to this case and say, well, we have a general assignment. Um, it follows, it's in line with this case. The petition should be granted in order to transfer the asset that we're trying to get into the trust. So, you know, it's really kind of important to have all your, all these pieces of the puzzle at the beginning, because you never know what's going to happen at the end. I think the really big things that I've learned from doing a couple of Hexed petitions is specificity is your friend. Um, the, more, as the more specific you can be uh, in terms of describing the asset on a schedule, listing out addresses or you know, uh, assessors, um, parcel numbers or whatnot on these general assignments, they all speak to and can support your position if you were to ever have to do any kind of Hexstat petition saying, it's very clear that the, uh, the settlor or the grantor of the trust intended these assets to go into the trust. You know, here's my support. It's listed on Schedule A. It's listed on the, on the general assignment, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, it's pretty hard to, um, pretty hard to, I think, fight that. Now, with this said, with any of these petitions, um, you know, if you have somebody who objects, which totally is possible, it may not work the way that you intended um, because, but at the same time, you can't, again, control when and if somebody objects, you can only make sure that your position is as well supported as possible. So, you know, I'm not saying this is a bulletproof method for transferring assets in the face of an objecting beneficiary, but again, it's better than, than the alternative, which is if you don't have anything set up, then you just, the only method that you have at that point is to go through that full probate process. So just kind of listing out a couple of best practices for people. This is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but just some things and tips that I've heard that I've experienced that we try to implement to make sure that our clients are dealing with or are in the best position possible if something were to happen is, you know, I find that having or giving clients a checklist after trust creation of some sort to help them and inform them for how to transfer their assets into the trust is, is generally pretty helpful. It's kind of like giving the clients a little bit of homework. And I think they tend to appreciate um, getting some direction when it comes to their assets. Uh, I don't know how sophisticated your clients are, but mine just doesn't, no matter their intelligence level, and this is not a knock on anybody, but they do need some help because this may be a foreign area for them. And and they need an expert to really guide them as to what they're supposed to do and talk through some of that stuff. So I find, you know, some checklist is super helpful or just some kind of written document that they can go off with and say, okay, I've done this, I've done that. Um, I have questions about this, I have questions about that, but at least get that conversation started and have that as part of your maybe practice after you execute a um, estate plan. Like I said, kind of watch out for some of the high value assets that are outside of the estate and may not be subject to probate. Um, you know, one question that I often get is, should I update my checking account to the name of the trust? And I sometimes ask, well, how much money do you have in there regularly? Is it, are you talking about $200,000 or are you talking about $10,000 or, or what, what number range is in that checking list on, a, on an average balance? Because I want to make sure that we're not hitting that, that small estate's limit. Um, because if you do, then again, you have to go through the probate process. Most people, you know, it's probably going to be well under that. And it's a little bit of a judgment call. Um, I say, well, if you're not going to have, have, have high balances and it's sort of a revolving door of money in, money out every month, and it's relatively small, you're probably safe from having to update all your checks to the name of the trust. But at the same time, I do warn them, like we are if you're pushing up against that 166 limit, then to be safe, you're going to want to then update your checking account, for example. But 
again, it's just a conversation that I have. I don't say that you have to do it one way, but here are your options and here are the potential pitfalls and consequences. Um, kind of thinking through like what's, what's going to happen from start to finish for a client. You know, make sure you have all your doc backup documents in place in the event that you think you might have to do a Hegstad petition. Um, I heard a story from one practitioner who, who may be on this call is that they have a client who had shares that were in a company that were worth a significant amount. I'm going to make up a number and say something like $500,000. And for whatever reason, she refuses to put them in her trust for, I don't know if it's sentimental reasons, if she was concerned that she would um, lose them or, or, or whatnot. I don't know what the psychology behind that was, but we do have some clients who they want to hold on to something and they don't want to put it in their trust. And in, in that situation, the you know, absent them changing their minds, perhaps the only other option you have is to maybe is to have to do a Hegstead when they pass away. And in that situation, you want to make sure your your ducks, your doc, backup documents are on all in place, that you have the pour over will, that you have the general assignment, that you have a schedule of assets, and you're listing out these things as specifically as possible in order to make sure that the process post death is as smooth as it can be given the situation. And the last comment I think may be the hardest for some attorneys, depending on the frequency by which you have contact with your clients. I know in my past experience, sometimes you go several years without talking with a client and then they come to you and their whole financial picture has changed and then you have to have a completely different conversation with them, which I know has happened to many of us. But to the extent you can, or maybe this is something you tell them at the beginning is, you know, you check in with your clients and say, okay, anytime you have new assets, please make sure that you do X with them or that you contact me or that we, we have a discussion about how it should be titled. Or if you don't want to have that discussion and if, if it falls in these categories, like we discussed before, here's how you deal with it. And, and just to have some kind of brief or preliminary conversation to remind the client and educate them a little bit that going forward, they still have work to do as they build their portfolios, they build their assets or buy and sell things. You know, it's not just, an estate plan is not a static thing. It's a living and breathing creature and things change, situations change. So you're trying to give or put the client in the best position possible so they don't run into some of these, um, you know, some of these problems. Um, okay, so um, I am going to try and answer as many of the questions as I can because we have a number of them. So I'm going to sort of go in order. Uh, the first one is a partnership agreement with a death provision that specifically says interest transfer to a surviving spouse or surviving issue in equal shares per stirpes. Would you say that is a non-probate asset because of the agreement, even though not named? I mean, I think that's actually a really interesting question. Um, my my sense is that probably it it, it could pro as long as the agreement and, and it's I guess it's sort of like a you know buy sell or maybe um. You know, those, those agreements that a lot of business partners have that if one of them passes, then here's how their assets or that particular business interest should go. Um, I would say that as long as the, you know, the, the partnership is going to respect that, which I would assume that they do because it is an agreement that it doesn't have to be um, probated and that internally it could be handled by the company. So um, my sense is yes, but it may also depend on the internal governance, but um that's my that's my best uh, best response to that. Um, the other question that I see is: Can a pour over will and hex step petition be used to transfer IP or intellectual property into a trust? Also, a great question. Um, I don't have a ton of experience dealing with um, intellectual property, so my 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 response may be limited. But my my sense is that. It can be, but I know that there are a lot of nuances with intellectual property um, that maybe maybe I'm not considering. I will say that there have been a couple of situations where um, we've dealt with clients who have some IP, whether it's, you know, and I think it depends so, somewhat on, on the IP, like if it's a copyright, trademark, um, you know, things of royalties, things of that nature. And, and so, 
you know, I'm not 100% positive that you can use those techniques in order to transfer it. So, you know, I'm not, I can't profess to be the best person, but I do know that in those situations, we have at least set up something in the general assignment or maybe a separate assignment of intellectual property to indicate that those assets are intended to be owned by the trust. I haven't seen it tested, quite frankly, uh, to see if that would work in a Hexted situation, but my hope is that it would. So that's sort of the best answer I can I can give to that question. Um, let's see, sorry, I'm just going through some of this stuff. Oops. The other question here I see is, can an executor use small state affidavit to gain access to a bank account of the decedents if the executor is not otherwise listed as a successor beneficiary of the will? If not, how does the executor of a small estate get money in order to pay administration costs when probate is avoided under the small estate threshold? Okay, I'm trying to understand this question. I'm not sure if I'm understanding the question, but um, if there's a bank account that is that you can put under or that falls under the small estate's affidavit, so let's say there's a bank account with $100,000, my assumption is that you can use the small, and then that, if that's the only asset that is outside or that, so that the total amount is not 166, it's just 100. My assumption is that you could use the small estate's affidavit for, uh, to, to get that account, basically. Um, I guess the question is, you know, are you, is there, a tr there's, there's more details that I think would, I need to know. It's like, is there a trust? Is, is it just an executor under a will? Um, and so, you know, I think if you can use that process to just get access, then that's, that's one of the ways that you can do it. But, you know, apologies, I'm not quite, quite understanding the question. Other question is, is the general assignment, assignment of assets, a separate document or a clause within one of your other estate documents, example, a trust or a will. Um, I typically have it as a separate, completely separate document, um, separate from the will, separate from the trust. Uh, and a couple of things that I forgot to mention about the general assignments that I've seen or typically use is it says that every, it says that the intention is for everything to be in the trust, except for a couple of um, at types of assets. It excludes jointly held assets with like rights of survivorship, retirement accounts, beneficiary does that benefit uh, documents or assets with beneficiary designations, because the intention behind that is you don't want the general assignment to conflict with those other documents. Because one quick story I'll share is that we have had a situation at my old firm where the, I forget whether it was a general assignment or the schedule listed a jointly held asset or jointly held account, but that account was a sort of joint, um, joint account by right, with right of survivorship and they didn't update title. So there was kind of a dispute as to what the settlor intended and he had passed away at that point. So it's not like we could ask him. And there was some litigation around, well, who, who owns this account? Because the general assignment didn't exclude it. The, you know, it was listed on schedule. It was, um, the title wasn't updated. So there's, there's all sorts of confusion around this, around this particular account. And in that situation, you just want to be very careful. Again, like I mentioned, have those conversations and make sure you're dealing with the asset accordingly because you never want to put the trust or the estate plan in a position where there is um, ambiguity and within ambiguity, there's there's room for dispute. So just wanted to highlight, it is something that does happen in real life. So just be aware of it and, and be careful. So um, just wanted to highlight that point. Another question is, can an LLC operating agreement designate a right of survivorship to a living member to keep a deceased member's interest out of probate? Um, I, th I think that's somewhat similar to the earlier question about a partnership agreement, um, where you can list who, who gets the, the asset um, or what happens if somebody passes away. Um, 
you know, it, it's sort of up in the air, like whether or not the company is going to respect that. I will say, though, the way that we've handled LLC or private interest in the past is we just as a precaution, we do a general, not a general assignment. We do a specific assignment of that interest to show that the intention is to be owned by the trust and that it, it, it can be distributed in accordance with that. So, you know, I, I think whatever you can do to avoid getting that, avoid having to probate that interest, you know, you want to ha- have those questions up front. Like, is the company going to respect that? If not, then what are your alternatives? Um, I will say maybe you don't want to rely on that without having those discussions first, because in the end, at the end, if the company decides they're not going to honor that because they need something from court or they need something official, like documentation saying this is what they, this is what the person or the deceased person wanted with uh, who gets their interest, then you know it's much harder to have those conversations after a person is has died versus at the beginning where everyone is still alive. Um, last question I think we have time for is. How do, how do you properly fund digital assets into a trust? This is a very interesting question. I was hoping it would not come up, but um, again, digital assets is sort of a, you know, my, personally, I feel like it's a little bit of a gray area and, you know, th- there's a question of like, we've, I've seen clauses in general assignments and things that, that cover or that it's intended to cover certain types of digital assets and also to have provisions within a trust saying how digital assets can be dealt with by the trustee once it's you know purportedly received under the general assignment. In function, I feel like so many there's so many different kinds of digital assets, and you know whether it's a license, whether it's an ownership thing, and if those companies that hold, for example, like a I'll use something simple that's not really worth a lot, like your your email account or iTunes account. You know, are are those licenses? Can you transfer it to somebody? I I really wonder. Like, do the does Apple dictate um, have their own rules as to how those assets supposedly get transferred? I think in the for in Apple, I heard that it's more of a licensee situation as opposed to ownership. But you know, it's so varied across the companies that I, I know that they're trying. There's some legislation that's trying to, um, you know, make this whole digital asset class more, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, more um, unified, but I'm not sure if we're quite there yet. But I think in practice, we try to, we've tried to say as much as we can, everything that the, the client owns, including digital assets should be in the trust. And we either do it via the assignment or some other language to try and incorporate that. But again, in practice, I'm, I'm, it's so varied across the board. I'm not quite sure how it all plays out, unfortunately. Um, and so if you'll bear with me, I think we have one last question, which I'll just answer, which I'll just go through. What is the purpose of a general assignment of assets? Is it merely to confirm what is already stated in the estate planning documents? Um, I, I think it, it's sort of, again, twofold, process, twofold um, document. It's a belt and suspenders approach that says everything I own, with the exception of you know, some specific categories of assets, I intend it for it to be in my trust. So it, it's, it helps with that Hegstead petition, that intention that they're talking about, that you want everything you own to be put into the trust. So I think that's one of the purposes of the general assignment. Second purpose, I think, is for certain things that just don't have title. Like I don't have title showing I own my clothes and I own my furniture or I own my jewelry or I own the art that's hanging on the wall. And so that general assignment is kind of meant to be a catch-all for all of that stuff. So it makes it very clear uh, what the, what intang- or not intangibles, what tangible things that are not asked, that are not accounts or or um, you know bank accounts or real property, things of that nature. It's just meant as that backstop to support that intention. So, you know, my sense is that it's primarily for this Hegstad, uh, Ukestad type uh, type petition, but also just this general intention of helping the trustee or whoever is your your fiduciary to understand. Okay, I, I do want everything in my trust and. That's how I want it to go or be distributed once I pass. Um, so I think that's all the time we have since we're at the 1.30 mark. Uh, I want to thank everyone for their attention and just for bearing with, with us during this program and just for being um, on this call with us. So I hope everyone has a good rest of your day and uh, thank you again for your time. <laughs>